thank heavens, the crisis, the danger is past, and the lingering illness is over at last, and the fever called living is conquered at last. Sadly, I know I am shorn of my strength, and no muscle I move as I lie at full length, but no matter, I feel I am better at length. And I lie so composedly now in my bed that any beholder might fancy me dead, might start at beholding me, thinking me dead. The moaning, the groaning, the sighing and sobbing are quieted now with that horrible throbbing at heart, with that horrible horrible throbbing, the sickness, the nausea, the pitiless pain have ceased with the fever that maddened my brain, the fever called living that burned in my brain. And oh, of all tortures that tortured, the worst has abated the terrible torture of thirst. For the naphthaline river of passion accursed, I have drank of a water that quenches all thirst of a water that flows with a lullaby sound from a spring, but a very few feet underground, of a cavern not very far underground. And oh, let it never be foolishly said that my room, it is gloomy and narrow my bed, for man never slept in a different bed, and to sleep one must slumber in just such a bed. My tantalized spirit here blandly reposes, forgetting or never regretting its roses, its old agitations of myrtles and roses. For now, while so quietly lying, it fancies a holier odor about it, of pansies, a rosemary odor commingled with pansies, with rue and the beautiful Puritan pansies. And now, so happily bathed in the many, a dream of the truth about it, the beauty of Annie, drowned in the tresses of Annie. She tenderly kissed me and fondly caressed, and then I fell gently to sleep on her breast, deeply to sleep, the heaven of her breast, when the light was extinguished, she covered me warm and she prayed to the angels to keep me from harm, to the queen of the angels to shield me from harm. And I lie so composedly now in knowing her love that you fancy me dead. And I lie so contentedly now in my bed with her love at my breast that you fancy me dead. But my heart, it is brighter than all of the many stars in the sky. For it sparkles with Annie. It glows with the light of the love of my Annie. With the thought of the light of the eyes of my Annie. True, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I have been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard many things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. But how then am I mad? Hearken, and observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. 
passion there was none. I love the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. It was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded, with what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it, oh so gently. And then, when I made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening, so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha! Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously, oh so cautiously, cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And I did this for seven long nights, every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone, and inquiring how he has passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed, to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves quickly, more quickly, than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph. To think that there I was, opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with the thick darkness, for the shutters were close fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it on, steadily, steadily. I had it in my head in, and was about to open the lantern, when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still, and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt, and pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise, when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, It is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It is only a mouse crossing the floor, or it is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, 
a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a simple dim ray, like the thread of the spider, shot out from the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could not see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct, precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of the sense? Now I say, there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart, and increased my fury as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker, and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous. So I am. And now at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still. But the beating grew louder, louder. I thought the heart might burst, and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once, ah! once only. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head and the arms and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a, with a light heart, for what had I to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. 
The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. But they sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but they still sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feelings, but it continued and gained definitiveness, until at length... I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased, and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound, much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards, but the noise overall and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no! They heard, they suspected, they knew! They were making a mockery of my horror! This I thought, and this I think, but anything was better than this agony! Anything was more tolerable than this derision! I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die, and now again, hark! Louder! 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 Villains! Dissemble no more! I admit the deed! Here! Here! It is the beating of his hideous heart. Death has reared himself a throne in a strange city lying alone. Far down within the dim west, where the good and the bad and the worst and the best have gone to their eternal rest. Their shrines and palaces and towers, tiny in towers and tremble not, resemble nothing that is ours around by lifting winds forgot. Resignedly beneath the sky, the melancholy waters lie. No rays from the holy heaven come down on the long night time of the town. But light from out the lurid sea streams up the turrets silently, gleams up the pinnacles far and free, up domes, up spires, up kingly halls, up fanes, up Babylon-like walls, up shadowy long-forgotten bowers of sculptured ivy and stone flowers, up many a many marvelous shrine whose wreathed friezes intertwine, the vile, the violet, in the vine, resignedly beneath the sky, the melancholy waters lie. So blend the turrets and shadows there, that all seem pendulous in air, while in the proud tower in the town, death looks gigantically down. There opens fanes and gaping graves, yawn level with the luminous waves, but not the riches there that lie in each idol's diamond eye. Not the gaily jeweled dead tempt the waters from their bed, for no ripples curl, alas, along that wilderness of glass. No swellings tell that winds may be upon some far-off happier sea. No heavings hint that winds have been on seas less hideously serene. But lo, a stir is in the air. The wave, there is movement there. As if the towers had thrust aside in slightly sinking the dull tide, as if their tops had feebly given a void within the filmly heaven. The waves have now a redder glow, the hours are breathing faint and low. And when amid no earthly moans, down, down that town shall settle hence. Hell, rising from a thousand thrones, shall do it reverence.
From childhood's hour I have not been. As others were, I could not see. As others saw, I could not bring my passions from a common spring. From a common source I have not taken. My sorrow I could not awaken. My heart to joy at the same tone, and all I loved, I loved alone. Then in my childhood, in the dawn, of a most stormy life was drawn. From every depth of good and ill, the mystery which binds me still. From the torrent or the fountain or the red cliff of the mountain, from the sun that round me rolled in its autumn tint of gold, from the lightning in the sky as it flashed me passing by, from the thunder and the clouds that took the form when all of the rest of heaven was blue, of a demon in my view. Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells, what a world of merriment their melody foretells. How they twinkle in the icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle, all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight, keeping time in a sort of runic rhyme to the tintin abulation that so musically wells from the bells, from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Hear the mellow wedding bells, golden bells. What a world of happiness their harmony foretells. Through the balmy air of night, how they ring out their delight. From the molten golden notes and all in tune. What a liquid ditty floats to the turtle dove that listens while she gloats on the moon. Oh, from out the sounding cells, what a gush of euphony voluminously wells. How it swells, how it dwells on the future how it tells of the rapture that impels to the swinging and the ringing of the bells, to the rhyming and the chiming of the bells. Hear the loud Illyrian bells, brazen bells, what a tale of terror their turbulency tells. In the shaken ear of night, how they scream with an off-right. Too much horrified to speak, they can only shriek, shriek at a tune. In the clamorous appealing, in the mercy of fire, in the mad exposition of the death and frantic fire, leaping higher, higher, higher with a desperate desire, in a resolute endeavor, not to sit, or never. By the side of the pale-faced moon, oh, the bells, what a tale the terror tells of despair! And, they, and hear the bells ring and clang and roar, oh, the horror they outpour in the bosom of the palpitating air. And yet the ear can distinctly tell by the twanging and the ranging how the danger ebbs and flows. And the ear can distinctly tell by the jangling and the wrangling how the danger sinks and swells in the sinking of the swelling, and the danger of the bells, oh, the bells! And the clamor, and the clangor of the bells. Hear the tolling of the bells, iron bells. What a world of solemn thought their monody compels. In the silence of the night, how we shiver with affright at the melancholy menace of their tone. For every sound that floats from the rust within their throats is a groan. And the people, ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple all alone. And to tolling in that muffled monotone, feel a glory in so rolling on the human heart a stone. They are neither man nor woman. They are neither brute nor human. They are ghouls and their king it is who tolls and he rolls a paean from the bells, and his merry bosom swells with the paean of the bells, and he dances and he yells, keeping time in a sort of runic rhyme to the paean of the bells, keeping time in a sort of runic rhyme to the throbbing of the bells, to the sobbing of the bells, keeping time as he knells in a happy runic rhyme to the tolling of the bells, to the rolling of the bells, to the moaning and the groaning of the bells.
Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this, and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember, it was in that bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my books or cease of sorrow, sorrow for lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now to still the beating of my heart I stood repeating, to some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, this it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating, then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into the darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, as an echo murmured back the word, Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon again I heard a tapping somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what their attis and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment, and this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mane of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of Pallathus just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast above the sculpted bust above his chamber door, with such name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on that placid bust spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken, by a reply so aptly spoken, Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. 
caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, till the songs one burden bore, to the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, of never, nevermore. But the raven still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird, and bust, and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But his velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall pass, ah, nevermore. Then methought the air grew denser, perfumed by an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tingled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by God these angels he hath sent thee. Respite, respite and nepenthe thee from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, oh quaff this kind nepenthe thee, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, where the tempter sent, where the temptest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me, truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven. Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still if bird or devil, by the heaven that bends us, by the God we both adore, tell this soul with sorrow laden, within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, Quote the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie that thou hast spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak throughout my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quote the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas, just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted. Nevermore, 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 nevermore. The happiest day, the happiest hour my seared and blighted heart hath known, the highest hope of pride and power I feel hath flown. Of power, said I, yes, but such I ween, they have vanished long, alas, the visions of my youth have been, but let them pass. And pride, what have I now with thee? Another brow may even inherit the venom thou hast poured on me, be still my spirit. The happiest day, the happiest hour, my eye shall see have ever seen the brightest glance of pride and power I feel have been. But with that hope of pride and power now offered with the pain, even then I felt that brightest hour 
I would not live again. For on its wing was dark alloy, and as it fluttered, fell, in essence, powerful to destroy a soul that knew it well. In visions of the dark night, I have dreamed of joy departed, but a waking dream of life and light hath left me broken hearted. Ah, what is not a dream by day to him whose eyes are cast on things around him with a ray turned back upon the past? That holy dream, that holy dream, while all the world were chiding, hath cheered me with a lovely beam, a lonely spirit guiding. What though that light trough storm and night so trembled from afar, what could there be more purely bright in truth day star? Once there was a silent bell where the people did not dwell. They had gone unto the wars, trusting to the mild-eyed stars, nightly from their azure towers, keeping watch above the flowers, in the midst of which all day the red sunlight lazily lay. Now each visitor shall confess the sad valley's restlessness. Nothing, there is motionless. Nothing, save the airs that brood over the magic solitude. Ah, by no wind are stirred those trees that palpitate like the chill seas among the misty Hebrides. Ah, by no wind those clouds are driven that rustled through an unquiet heaven. Uneasily from morn till evening, over the violets there that lie in myriad types of the human eye, over the lilies there that wave and weep above a nameless grave. Eternal dews come down in drops, they wave, from out their fragrant tops, they weep, perennial tears come down in drops. I was sick, sick unto death with a long agony, and when they at length unbound me, I was permitted to sit. I felt that my sentence were leaving me, the sentence the dread sentence of death was the last of distinct accentuation which reached my ears. The figures of the judges vanished as if magically. There came a thronging upon my recollection of a thousand vague rumors of the horrors of Toledo. Of dungeons, there had been strange things narrated, fables I had always deemed them, but yet strange and too ghastly to repeat, save in a whisper. I was left to perish of starvation in this subterranean world of darkness, or what fate, perhaps even more fearful, awaited me. That the result would be death, a death more than customary bitterness, I knew too well the character of my judges to doubt. The mode and the hour were all that occupied or distracted me. At first, I proceeded with extreme caution, for the floor, although seemingly of solid material, was treacherous with slime. At length, however, I took courage and did not hesitate to step firmly endeavoring to cross in as direct a line as possible. I had advanced some ten or twelve paces in this matter, when the remnant of the torn hem of my robe came entangled between my legs. I stepped on it and fell violently on my face. My chin rested upon the floor of the prison, but my lips and the upper portion of my head, although seemingly at a less elevation than my chin, touched nothing. At the same time, my forehead seemed bathed in the clammy vapor, and the peculiar smell of decayed fungus arose to my nostrils. I put around my arm and shuddered to find that I had fallen at the very brink of a circular pit, whose extent I had no means of exterminating at the moment. Groping about the masonry just below the margin, I succeeded in dislodging a small fragment and let it fall into the abyss. For many seconds, I hearkened to its reverberations as it dashed against its sides of its chasm in the 
the scent. At length, there was a sullen plunge into water, succeeded by loud echoes. Upon arousing, I found by my side a loaf and a pitcher of water. A burning thirst consumed me, and I emptied the vessel at a drought. I must have been drugged. Scarcely had I drunk before I became irresistibly drowsy. A deep sleep fell upon me. A sleep like that of death. How long it has lasted, of course, I know not. But when, once again, I unclosed my eyes, the objects around me were visible, which I could not at first determine. I now lay upon my back at full length on a species of low framework of wood. To this, I was securely bound by a long strap resembling a surgical. I passed in many convolutions about my limbs and body, leaving at liberty only my head and my left arm to such extent that I could, by dint of much exertion, supply myself with food from the earthen dish which lay by my side. Looking upward, I surveyed the ceiling of my prison. It was some thirty or forty feet overhead, It constructed much as the side walls. In one of its panels, a very singular figure riveted my whole attention. It was a painted figure of time, as he is commonly represented, save that in lieu of a skith, which held what, at a casual glance, I supposed to be a pictured image of a huge pendulum, such as we see on antique clocks. There's something, however, in the appearance of this machine which caused me to regard it more attentively, while I gazed directly upward at it. For its position, I was immediately over my own. I fancied that I saw it in motion. In an instant, afterward the fancy was confirmed. Its sweep was brief, and of course slow. I watched it for some minutes, somewhat in fear, but more in wonder. Wearied at length of observing its dull movement, I turned my eyes upon the other objects in the cell. It might have been half an hour, perhaps even an hour, before I, before I again cast my eyes upward. What I then saw confounded and amazed me. The sweep of the pendulum had increased in extent by nearly a yard. As a natural consequence, its velocity was also much greater. But what mainly disturbed me was the idea that it had perceptibly descended. I now observed with what horror, it was needless to say, that its neither extremity was formed by a crescent of glittering steel, about a foot in length from horn to horn, the horns upward, and the upper edge evidently as keen as that of a razor. Like a razor, also, it seemed massy and heavy, tapering from the edge into a solid, broad structure above. It was appended to a weighty rod of brass, and the hole hissed as it swung through the air. With painful effort, I outstretched my left arm as far as my bonds permitted, and took possession of the small remnant which had been spared me by the rats. With the particles of the oily and spicy viand now remained, I thoroughly rubbed the bandage wherever I could reach it. Then, raising my hand from the floor, I read breathlessly still. At first, the raven's animals were startled and terrified at the change, at the cessation of the movement. They shrank alarmingly back. Many sought the well, but this was only for a moment. Free! And in the grasp of the Inquisition, free! I had but escaped death in one form of agony, to be delivered unto worse than death in some other. During this period, I became aware, for the first time, of the origin of the sulfurous light which illuminated in the cell. It proceeded from a fissure, about half an inch in width, extending entirely from the prison at the base of the walls, which thus appeared and were completely separated from the floor. I endeavored, but of course in vain, to look through this aperture. Even while I breathed, there came to my nostrils a the breath of vapor of heated iron. A suffocating odor pervaded the prison, 
A deeper glow settled each moment in the eyes that glared at my agonies. A richer tint of crimson diffused itself over the picture's horrors of blood. I panted. I gasped for breath. There could not be no doubt of the design of my tormentors. Oh, most unrelenting. Most demonic of men. I shrank from the glowing metal to the center of the cell. Amid the thought of the fiery destruction that impeded, the idea of coolness of the well came over my soul like bomb. I rushed to its deathly brink. I threw my straining vision below. The glare from the enkindled roof illuminated its inmost recesses. Yet, for a wild moment, did my spear refuse to comprehend the meaning of what I saw. Oh, horror. Oh, any horror but this. Death, I said. Any death but that of the pit. Fool, might I have not known that into the pit was the object of the burning iron to urge me? Could I resist its glow? Or even that, could I withstand its pressure? I shrank back, but the closing walls pressed me relentlessly forward. At length, for my scared and writhing body, there was no inch but a foothold of the firm floor of the prison. I struggled no more, but the agony of my soul found vent in one loud long final scream of despair. Dim vows and shadowy floods and cloudy looking trees whose forms we can't discover for the tears that drip all over, huge moons their wax and wane ever changing places and they put out our starlight with the breath from their pale faces. About twelve by the moon dial, one more filmy than the rest, a kind which upon trial they have found to be the best. Comes down, still down, and down, with its center on the crown, of a mountain's eminence, while its wide circumference, in easy drapery falls, over hamlets, over halls, wherever they may be, or the strange woods, o'er the sea, over the spirits on the wing, over every drowsy thing, and buries them up quite in a labyrinth of light, and then how deep, oh deep, is the passion of their sleep. In the morning they arise, and their moony covering is soaring in the skies, with tempest as they toss, like almost anything, or a yellow albatross. They use the moon no more for the same end as before, but less it a tent, which I think extravagant. It atomies, however, into a shower dissever, in which the butterflies of earth come down and seek the skies. And so come down again, never consented things, have brought a specimen upon, upon their quivering, quivering wings. By a root obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, or an endolin named night, on a black throne rain uptight. I have reached these lands but newly, haunted by an ultimate dim foolie, from a wild weird climb that lieth sublime, out of space, out of time. Bottomless vales and boundless floods, chasms, caves, and titan woods, with forms that no man can discover, for the tears that drip fall over. Mountains toppling evermore into seas without a shore, seas that restlessly aspire, surging unto skies of fire. Lakes that endlessly outspread their lone waters, lone and dead. Their still waters, still and chilly, with the snows of the lolling lily. By the lakes that thus outspread, their lone waters, lone and dead. Their sad waters, sad and chilly, with the snows of the lolling lily. By the mountains near the river, murmuring lowly, murmuring ever. By the gray woods near the swamps, where the newt and the toad encamp. By the dismal tarns and pools where dwell the ghouls. By each spot the most unholy, in each nook the most melancholy. There the travelers meet aghast, stolen shadows from the past, shrouded figures that stay and sigh as the wanderer pass them by. White-robed forms in friends long given to agony in earth and to heaven. <laughs> <laughs>
For the heart whose woes are legion, tis a peaceful, soothing region. For the spirit that walks in shadow, tis, oh, tis an El Dorado. But the traveler traveling through it may not, dare not, openly view it. Never its mysteries are exposed to the weak human eye unclosed. So wills its king who hath forbid the uplifting of the fringed lid. And so the sad soul that here passes beholds it but through darkened glasses. By a root obscure and lonely, haunted by ill angels only, where an endolin named night on a black throne reign uptight. I have wandered home but newly from this ultimate dim fully. Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, this much let me avow. You are not wrong who deem that my days have been a dream. Yet, if hope has flew away in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. I stand amid the roar of a surf-tormented shore, and I hold within my hand the grains of golden sand. How few, and how they creep through my fingers to the deep, while I weep, while I weep. O oh God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? O oh God, can I not save but one from the pitiless wave? Is all that we see or seem but a dream within a dream? It was many, and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived, whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, chilling my Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kingsmen came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes. That was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea. A wind blew out of a cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, yet I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulcher by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You who so well knows the nature of my soul will not suppose, however, that this gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point definitely settled. But the very definitiveness of which it was to be resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not be punished, but punished with impunity. 
A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. A wrong is equally unredressed when one fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato. Although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared, he prided himself on his connoisseurship of wine. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself, and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening, during the supreme madness of the carnival season, that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done ringing in his hand. I said to him, <laughs> uh, Fortunato! <laughs> Montresor! Uh, you are luckily met! How yeah. remarkably well you are looking today! Oh. I have <laughs> received a cask of what passes for Amontillado, oh, yes. and I have my doubts. How? Amontillado? A cask? Impossible and in the middle of carnival? I have my doubts, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. <laughs> Uh, you were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado. I have my doubts. Amontillado. I must satisfy them. Amontillado. Um, as you are engaged, <laughs> I am on my way to Lucrezia. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He can tell me. Lucrezia cannot tell Amontillado from Jerry. <laughs> and yet, uh, some fools have it that his taste is a match for your oh, own. Oh, come. Let us go. Whither? <laughs> to your vault. Uh, my friend, no. I will not impose upon your good nature. Uh, you are engaged. <laughs> I have no engagement. Come. It is, it is not the engagement, my friend, but the severe <coughs> cold which I perceive you are afflicted. The Let's walls go. are inseparably damp. Nevertheless. The walls are encrusted with nitre. Amontillado. <laughs> the cold is merely nothing. Oh, and as for Lucrezi, he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. <laughs> <laughs> there were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning, and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient. I knew well to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces a flambeau, and bowed Fortunato through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I had passed down a long, winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent, and stood upon the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells upon his cap jingled as he strode. The cask? It is farther on, but observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. <laughs> How long have you had that cough? It is nothing. <laughs> Come, we will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy, as I once was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back, you will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucrece. Enough! The coughs are mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True, true, and indeed I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily, but you should use all proper caution. A draft of this medoc will defend us from the dance. Drink. <laughs> I drink to the berry that repose around us. And I to your long life. These vaults are extensive. The Montresors were a great, numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot of gold in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. Ah, oh, and the motto? Nemo me pune la cesset. Good. We had passed through long walls of piled skeletons, with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of the catacombs. I paused again, 
and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The nitre. See, it increases. It hangs like a moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. <coughs> now, come, we will go back. Ere it is too late. Your cough is... <laughs> it is nothing. Let us go on. Uh, but first, another trout of the medoc. But first, let us proceed to the Amontillado. Be it so. Proceed. Herein is the Amontillado. As for Lucrece... He is an ignoramus! Pass your hand over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me employ you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. <coughs> but I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado. <laughs> True. The Amontillado. <laughs> A very good joke. <laughs> Indeed. An excellent jest. <laughs> we will have many a rich laugh about it at the palazzo. <laughs> Over our wine. <laughs> the Amontillado! <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the Amontillado. <laughs> but is it not getting late? <laughs> Will not they be <laughs> waiting us at the Palazzo? Lady Fortunato and the rest? <laughs> Let us be gone. Yes. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor! Yes! For the love of God! 
Fortunato. Fortunato! I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick. It was the dampness of the catacombs that made it so. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. And against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. And for the last half century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requiescat. Thank mm -hmm. you.